The Third Angel's Message, number 7, by A.T. Jones. Some of the folks wondered last night whether I was not making things rather strong, but I think after what Brother Porter read from the testimonies just now, all agree that it was just straight. I do not want you to think, brethren, that I'm making things up to say here just because it's you. If I had been preaching since last Monday night to a people who never heard of a Seventh-day Adventist, nor the third angel's message, I would preach to them just exactly what I have to you, because I do not know what else to give them now than the third angel's message. I do not know what else to do to people wherever I do preach than to bring them face to face with their need of the power of God. So I'm not saying anything to you yet that I would not have said to anybody. It might come after a while that I shall say something to you that I would not to other people, because maybe some of us have been doing things that other people would not do, but that is the only reason. Now let us glance again at a summary of the lessons we've had. We have found that there is nothing that will hold us up in this time but the power of God. We have found that nothing will satisfy us, Nothing will do for us but the character of God. We have found in the matter of means and business affairs, so far as this world is concerned, that we cannot depend upon any of these any more, but only upon the things that God gives. We have found that as to life itself, we cannot count on that any more, the only thing that will satisfy, the only thing that we can depend upon, the only thing that will meet our demand, the demand of the people who will now stand for the Lord, is that life that is better than this one, the life that is eternal, the life of God. Well then, first, nothing will support us but the power of God. And where do we find the power of God? In Jesus Christ. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That is what he is. Where do we find the character of God? In Christ. Where do we find all things, the great things of God? In Christ. Where do we find a better life than this? The life of God? In Christ. Well then, what in the world have we to preach to the world but Christ? What have we to depend upon but Christ? Then what is the third angel's message but Christ? Christ, the power of God. Christ, the unsearchable riches of God. Christ, the righteousness of God. Christ, the life of God. Christ is God. That is the message that we are now to give to the world, is it not? Then what does the world need? Christ. Do they need anything else? No. Is there anything else? No. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. As I said a while ago, if I had been preaching to a people that had never heard anything about the third angel's message, if I had been preaching to them since Monday night, I would preach just as I have, and bring them face to face with Jesus Christ just as we have. And by the way, there is a whole congregation of infidels that are just in that place, waiting now to give me an invitation sometime to come and speak the next time. And that is what I am going to tell them. A whole congregation, professed to be nothing but infidels, have given me the opportunity to speak to them three times already, and I have spoken on these things just as they are, right before men's faces, and they have already asked, What are we to do? And one of them said, Well, he has told us all these things, and it's all plain, but he has not told us what to do. Well, said I, I did not have time to tell you what to do tonight. Give me a chance, and I will tell you what to do. They said, All right, and I will do it. When that time comes... I propose to tell them just what to do. I propose to set before them just what I have set before you, that if they are going to oppose this church and state movement, they have got to set aside all ideas of earthly dependence. 
They have got to set aside all thoughts of riches or possessions or any of that kind. And all ideas are thoughts of life. And they can see it. And then I shall tell them they cannot afford to do that unless they get something better. And the thing better is Jesus Christ. And they must have him or else they cannot stand at all. Why, brethren, the world is ready to hear the message when we get the message. The world is ready to hear it, and they will hear it. Well, then, Christ the power of God, Christ the wisdom of God, Christ the unsearchable riches of God, and Christ the life of God. That is what we are to preach. Well, what is that all summed up in one thing? What expresses it? The gospel. What is it to preach the gospel? It is to preach the mystery of God, which is Christ in men, the hope of glory. What has God given to us to give to the world but the everlasting gospel to preach unto every kindred and nation and tongue and people? Revelation 14.6 Is not that what the message starts with? And then when men will not receive the everlasting gospel, nor worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, whom did they worship? The beast and his image. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And then the third angel's message says that they will worship the beast and his image. So that now men worship the beast and his image, or else they will worship God. That is settled. According to the message, as it is, and the time in which we are, the only thing people in this world can worship is him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water, or else the beast and his image. There is no halfway place. The three messages are simply one threefold message. In the special testimonies, in one that is addressed to brethren in responsible positions, we read on page 15, quote, While you hold the banner of truth firmly, proclaiming the law of God, let every soul remember that the faith of Jesus is connected with the commandments of God. The third angel is represented as flying through the midst of heaven, symbolizing the work of those who proclaim the first, second, and third angel's messages. All are linked together. Close quote. So that the opening thing, and the one thing of all, that which covers all of these messages, is the everlasting gospel. Now, we have referred a time or two to the Jewish church as an illustration of the situation in which we are. We have found that that church turned its back upon God and joined herself to Caesar in order to put Christ out of the way and to execute their mind concerning him. Then the Lord called out of that church and nation all who would obey him, all who would serve him before the nation was destroyed, and he did that work by those few disciples that believed in Jesus when he ascended to heaven. They had been with Jesus three years and a half. They had preached. They had even performed miracles in his name. He had sent them to preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so important was their message that if the place did not receive them, they were to shake the dust off from their feet before they left. Yet before they could preach the gospel, which he gave them to preach, when he ascended to heaven, he said, Tarry ye at Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Would not we have thought that their being with Christ three and a half years, hearing him, loving him, studying him, And with him, having been taught by him this length of time, and having even preached, it would naturally be supposed that they were fitted to carry the gospel to the world. But no, said he, tarry ye at Jerusalem. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye at Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Luke 24, verse 49. How much power was there enlisted against them and the message they were to preach? All the power of the world. For the church of God, the professed 
church of God, that whole nation had joined itself to Caesar, whose power filled the world. All the power of the world was allied against them. The professed church and nation of God had allied themselves to power and had arrayed it against God and the name of Christ. And yet this Christ, whom they had crucified, whom they had done their best to take away from the world and the minds of men, his disciples were to go and preach that very name and that very person and that faith only in him could save them. And they had to preach this in the face of all the power that the world then knew. Well, not very long before that, only about 12 days or two weeks before Jesus told them this, Peter got scared at a girl and denied that he knew Christ. There was a girl that began to say, I saw you with that Galilean. No, you did not. No, I don't know him. He came closer to the fire, and she got a better look at him. And she said, You're one of them. No, I'm not. No, I never knew him. And then, to prove it, he cursed and swore. Was he prepared to face all the power in the world? No. He needed to be acquainted with a kind of life and have hold of something that a girl could not scare him out of before he could face the world, did he not? And Jesus has told them all, You will all forsake me and flee this night. No, we will not, they all said. And Peter said, Though they all forsake you, I will not. And Jesus said, Before the cock crow, you will deny me three times, Peter. Though I should die with thee, I will not deny thee. And so likewise said they all. But they did forsake him, didn't they? In Matthew 26 Verses 31 to 35. Well then, we see that so far as themselves and their work was concerned, and so far as the power that was opposed their work was concerned, we stand exactly in the situation in which they stood at that time when Jesus ascended to heaven. We stand in exactly that place where all the power of this earth is allied against the message which we are to give to the world, and therefore we need, just as they, to be endued with power from on high. So it is a literal fact that we stand exactly where they did when Jesus ascended to heaven and told them to tarry until they got that power. So when he ascended, he said, as recorded in Acts 1, verse 8, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then what were they to tarry for? For the Holy Ghost. What was he to bring to them? The power. What was to endue them with power? The Holy Ghost. Now, I do not need to read the references from the little special testimonies and from gospel workers that Brother Prescott just read here, which are on the same things, how that the words of the Lord tell us that just as the disciples were doing that, so we now should be doing the same thing. How we should be gathered in companies, praying for the Holy Spirit, and how it required ten days of seeking God to bring them into the place where they could offer effectual prayer and receive that which they asked because they asked in that abiding faith that would receive what was asked. Nor do I need to read again those passages that I read from testimonies in manuscript that when the people of God individually seek for His Holy Spirit with all the heart, there will be heard from human lips the testimony that fulfills that word, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And prayers are ascending daily for the fulfillment of this promise of being endued with power. Then we have the word of the Lord that prayers are ascending daily. Are yours amongst them? Are mine amongst them? Now the day is going to come when the last prayer that will be necessary to bring that blessing will have ascended. Then what? It will come. The flood will burst and out will pour the Holy Spirit the day of Pentecost. 
Now notice, the word is, as prayers are ascending to God daily for this promise. Not one of those prayers put up in faith is lost. There is the blessedness of that promise, you see. Yes, when God tells us to pray for a thing, why, that opens the door wide for us to pray for that thing with the most perfect confidence that we shall receive it. When he tells us to pray for a thing, that throws open the door wide. And there's not a single thing to hinder that prayer from finding a lodgment there. What is his word to us? That not one of those prayers put up in faith is lost. Well, one of these days, the last prayer needed will be lodged there. And out the blessing will be poured. And who will receive it? Those whose prayers have ascended to God for it. I do not care whether that man is in the center of Africa. And that outpouring is here in Battle Creek. He will receive it. Because by our prayers for it, the channel is open between us and the source of the blessing. And just as certainly as we keep that channel open by our prayers, when the Spirit is poured out, it will reach the place where the prayers start from just as sure as can be, because the channel is open. Then, brethren, could we possibly have more encouragement for the prayers which we see by everything around us we must offer? Could there possibly be more encouragement for us to offer those prayers with all the heart and with perfect confidence? There is a word in Gospel Workers that I want to read which speaks plainly upon this question. Pages 370 and 371, speaking about the apostles, it says, quote, They were waiting in expectation of the fulfillment of his promise and were praying with special fervency. This is the very course that should be pursued by those who act a part in the work of proclaiming the coming of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. For a people are to be prepared to stand in the great day of God. Although Christ had given the promise to his disciples that they should receive the Holy Spirit, This did not remove the necessity of prayer. Close quote. Why, of course not. That opens the way to prayer. When God has not promised a thing, am I free to pray for that thing? No. Because we are going to ask according to his will. But when God has promised, should I do anything else than pray? That is the beauty of it. Quote, They prayed all the more earnestly. They continued in prayer with one accord. Those who are now engaged in the solemn work of preparing a people for the coming of the Lord should also continue in prayer. The early disciples were of one accord. They had no speculations, no curious theory to advance as to how the blessing was to come. Close quote. Now, the thought I'm after is this. They had no speculations, no curious theories to advance as to how the promised blessing was to come. That means us now. We are to have no curious theories as to just how it is going to come. If anyone begins to say, oh, it is coming as on the day of Pentecost, the sound of it, as the rushing of mighty wind will be just so and so, the tongues of fire will look just so and so, etc., etc. And so settle it thus and say, that is the way it is going to come the next time, and thus I shall know when it comes. The one who measures up this matter is any such way will never receive it. What they needed was to get their hearts right before God. And it was none of their business how the Lord would fulfill his promise. And that is exactly what we need. And it is none of our business how the Lord will fulfill his promise. He does not propose to have us dictate to him and say, the Holy Spirit must come in such a way or else it will not be the Holy Spirit. Then, if you have had any theory about it, just annihilate that theory tonight. And let your theories always stay annihilated. We have no right to fix up in our minds the way the Lord is going to do things. That was their situation. That is our situation. And brethren, just as certainly as the promise was fulfilled to them, so certainly it will be fulfilled now to those who are praying for the same thing. 
We do not know how long it will take. Another thing, they were to preach. What? The gospel. And Paul defines the gospel over and over to be the mystery of God, which had been hidden from ages and generations, now made manifest to his saints. They preached that gospel, that mystery of God. And what is that? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, the unsearchable riches of God. Christ in him crucified. That is what it was. Nothing but that. And Paul defined it in the sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians. You remember, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Verse 10. Don't you see the poor, poverty-stricken condition of the man that holds to what he has in his hands in this world? Don't you see the poor, poverty-stricken condition of that Seventh-day Adventist that will now hold to what he has in this world? He must have more than that, or he will never get through the time of trouble. But when we let everything go and count ourselves as having nothing, then what? Then what will we have? All things. Then they cannot take anything away from us. The people who are in that condition, nothing can be taken from them. Now is that so? Congregation. Yes, of course it is. They cannot take power from us, can they? They cannot take the character from us, can they? They cannot take our riches from us. They cannot take our life from us. For Christ is our life. And they cannot take him from us. So when we are in this position, we have the victory over the world in all its power to start with. Now another phrase in that same connection. Having nothing and yet possessing all things, as poor yet making many rich. That is our work in the world, to make people rich. As Jesus became poor, that we might be made rich, so we become poor, that many others may become rich. And so when we have Christ, Christ only, nothing but the unsearchable riches of Christ, we can make everybody rich who will take the free gift of the riches. They preached the mystery of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But there arose another mystery. It began to appear while they were preaching. This mystery that they were to preach had been hid from ages and generations. Now it was manifested as never before in the world. But while they were preaching that mystery, there appeared the working of another mystery. And that mystery of iniquity arose and hid again the mystery of God. After the apostles died, that mystery of iniquity arose and spread over the world and hid again the mystery of God from ages and from generations, didn't it? But when we come to the tenth chapter of Revelation, an angel is there represented as standing with one foot on the sea and the other on the land, and crying with a strong voice, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that are therein, and the earth, and the things that are therein, and the sea, and the things which are therein, and there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when it shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished." I have wondered lately whether that is not intentional, that it is put that way, that the mystery of God should be finished instead of shall be finished. It should have been finished long ago. The testimonies have told us that. But by our dilatoriness, our slackness, our slowness to believe God, it is not finished. He said it should be finished, Now, thank the Lord, it is to be finished indeed. If he would speak now, he would say, it shall be, of course. But the point is that when the voice of the seventh angel shall begin to sound, the mystery of God stands forth to the world. What is that? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the everlasting gospel. That is the third angel's message then don't you see how it is that God has settled it, that the third angel's message, the mystery of God, 
shall triumph over the mystery of iniquity, and that as certainly as the mystery of iniquity has held the attention of the world and has attracted the gaze of the nations and the wonder of men, just so certainly the mystery of God will attract the attention of nations and the wonder of men, it will do it. Now let us turn to the book of Joel and read that second chapter again. There are some things that we want to study. The first part of it, you remember, up to the 12th verse, not including the 12th, is a picture of the coming of the Lord. If you turn to that testimony, volume 1, page 180, that tells about the shaking, you will find this chapter there given by the Spirit of the Lord as the reference on which is based that idea. It applies to the time of the shaking, and the shaking prepares for the loud cry. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? The parallel is Revelation 19 verses 11 through 18. Therefore also now saith the Lord... Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garment. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Who here knows that when a person seeks the Lord with all the heart, whether or not the Lord will return and leave a blessing behind him? If we know his will, then let us go at it. There is all the encouragement in the world, just as certainly as we know he will do that. There is nothing to hinder us from seeking him with all the heart, because we know he will give the blessing. Let us have it. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. How many people in Zion does that include? The people, the congregation, the children, the elders, the babies, the bridegrooms, the brides. How many does that call? Audience, all. Yes, all. What does it call us to? to seek the Lord with all the heart, then let us do it. We are in the time. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, 
Weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Have not the heathen got things in their own hands, so that they propose to rule over us? And they propose to blot out the Sabbath of the Lord, and to rule over the world. I think I have a word here that I had better read on that, perhaps. On page 17 of the testimony entitled, To Brethren in Responsible Positions, I read these words. Quote, The false Sabbath is to be enforced by an oppressive law. Satan and his angels are wide awake and intensely active, working with energy and perseverance through human instrumentalities to bring about his purpose of obliterating the knowledge of God. What is the Sabbath a sign of? That he is the Lord our God and the Lord that sanctifies his people. Well then, when that sign by which he is known to the people, is taken out of the way, they take him away from the knowledge of the people. That is what they are after. And that thing is now done. I read before, quote, God's memorial has been torn down, and in its place a false Sabbath stands before the world, close quote. All the power of the earth is now enlisted in that business. So they propose to blot out the knowledge of God from the world. Therefore, we need to seek the Lord with all the heart, that the heathen shall not rule over us. Now let us see what he is going to do. Quote, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land, and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. Close quote. What is it that he will send? What is the oil? The oil of joy for mourning, joy in the Holy Ghost. What is the wine? Jotham tells us, wine that maketh glad the heart of God in man. Gladness then he will give. And what is the corn? The wheat, the grain, from which comes our bread to sustain life and supply strength. Strength then also will he give. Oh, then thank the Lord. He will send us strength and gladness and joy. But to whom will he send it? When will he send it? When the people are gathered, and the congregation assembled, and the children, and the babies, the elders, the bridegrooms, and the brides, the ministers, when we are gathered together, as the testimony says, in companies, seeking God with all the heart, then it is that he will do what he says. Let us go at it as never before. It is a wonderful thing when the Lord promises that we shall be satisfied with what he is going to give. It is not according to our measure. How much is God satisfied that we should be satisfied with? Nothing short of everything he has, for he gave just that in Jesus Christ. And he does not want us to stop short of everything he has. Just as Brother Haskell read in that blessed testimony this morning. You remember what wonderful thing that was? That when we come as beggars, having no desserts of our own, then all is ours in one everlasting gift. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. The margin of this verse says, He hath magnified to do great things. Who is it that has magnified to do great things? Who has all the power of the world in his hands? Satan. It is he who thinks he is going to do great things. Now let us see what the Lord will do just then. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Why, brethren, we ought to be the gladdest people in the world that Satan has to do great things, for it follows inevitably 
that when Satan has got to do great things, God is doing such great things that Satan has to exert himself to save his credit. But even then, he cannot save his credit, even though he has boasted before the world and the nations that he has all the power, his case gets so desperate at last that he has got to come to himself. But he can be gladder than ever, because then Jesus comes himself. But when is it that the Lord will do great things? When this one, Satan, has magnified himself to do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Why should we be discouraged? What is the use of it? What is the sense of it? Jesus said, lift up your heads, and this says, be glad and rejoice. And then says it over again. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Let us do it. Brethren, I just tell you, I don't know how to do anything else than be glad. For the Lord tells me to. And this is just as much the word of God as any part of the word of God. And the creative power is in these words just as much as any other to put the gladness there and to put the rejoicing there. And it is gladness, it is rejoicing in the Lord. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month, or as the first, as some versions read. Was that at Pentecost a moderate thing according to what God is going to do? Yes, he gave the former rain moderately. But is there going to be a double portion at this time? If that was moderate, what do you suppose this is going to be? We can't imagine what that was. Let me read you a word in volume 4, page 611. Quote, The Advent Movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. And the first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world. And in some countries, there was the grandest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. Another testimony that has never been printed says that this will come as suddenly as it did in 44 and with ten times the power. But now about the Pentecost. We read from the same page, 611 of volume 4, as follows. Quote, The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Close quote. Now you see there are prophecies pertaining only to the latter rain, but the prophecies pertaining to the former rain are to be fulfilled too in the giving of the latter rain. Then you see it is going to be double. Quote, Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out in the investigative judgment, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus. Does that mean we shall repent and be converted? Well, says one, I was converted 20 years ago. All right. Be converted now, too. I was converted nearly 19 years ago, but it does not amount to that, the snap of the fingers, if I'm not converted right now. It is no good to look way back there, says one. Do you mean to say that I was not converted? Oh, no, I do not mean anything of the kind. But I mean that if you depend upon that conversion way back there, it does not amount to anything. If you do not know how to repent anymore, just take Jesus Christ and you will know. Any man who received the Lord Jesus Christ is a new creature. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fats 
shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great arm which I send among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Then praise the Lord. They will reproach us. They will call us names. They will make us as the filth and the offscouring of the earth and the despised of the despised. But God has said, My people shall never be ashamed. And it means just that. But it does not stop there. He says it over. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Why, I tell you, brethren, what is it that the Lord has not put into that chapter for us? See the encouragement, the blessedness, the promises. And when it is necessary for him to repeat that, we shall never be ashamed. That means on the face of it, that it will be the purpose of everything on earth to put us to shame. But God has pledged his word that it shall not be done, and we shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Thank the Lord. He is not going to be content much longer with one prophet. He will have more. He has done a wonderful work with one. And having done such a great work with one, what in the world would he do when he's got a lot of them? And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Where is going to be deliverance? In the remnant whom the Lord shall call. But who is Satan making war against? The remnant. Who has Satan rallied all the powers of the earth against? The remnant. Where is he directing all his force and efforts? Against the remnant. And right there is deliverance, brethren. Brethren, the best place in the world to be is right where the devil is spending all his efforts because there is deliverance. That is where the grace and power of Jesus Christ are. And Satan has got to rally all his hosts to make any show at all. That is the best place on earth to be, because Christ is there, God is there, and my people shall never be ashamed. Brethren, I am awfully glad of these things. I am just as glad as I can be of what the Lord says in that chapter, because it is all present truth, you see. Every verse is right now and tells such wondrous things. He is going to do such wondrous things. And all he asks of us is to seek him with all the heart that we may have it all. If we seek him with half the heart, we cannot have it all. We want to seek him with all the heart to get all he has. Let us do what the Lord says and be glad and rejoice, ye children of Zion. For the Lord will do great things, and ye shall never be ashamed. And there is deliverance in the remnant that the devil is warring against with all his might. The end of sermon number seven.